Hi there, welcome to an interview with Lattice Training and today we have with myself, Tom Randall, James Pearson, uh, who sat on the sofa down in the Lattice headquarters with me and James is over visiting from France with his wife, Caro, and uh, I thought this would be a really good opportunity to get you sat down and talk about, I think there's a lot of things that we can talk about today. Um, sure, I think we've got to be careful not to talk about too many random things today, try and keep on topic. <laughs> yeah, we'll try and keep focused. Um, but for, for anyone who doesn't know uh, James, and I think that's going to be a relatively small number of people, you are who... Like flattering. And I, I'm going to say lots of good things about you now, and I've known you for a long time, but... You can say some bad things too. I can take it. I've learned to take bad things over the years. I'll, I'll get a few in, don't worry. Um, is James is, uh, I think, really one of the foremost trad climbers in the world. Um, he's done... He's repeated and established a lot of the hardest trad routes anywhere in the world, including some really hard uh, repeats of other people's routes, 9A sport routes. Um, at the time, he was flashing some of the very hardest boulders um, around V13 um, back in 2008 or so. And all the way through his climbing career, he's been often right at the forefront and the edge of uh, trad climbing in particular, uh, whether it's repeats or first ascents. And I think it's going to be really fascinating talking to James about what's behind his uh, approach, his strategy, his mindset around this. And I think James, you know, all the way from when you were 17 years old, climbing the zone, which was a really hard grip route, E9, all the way through to, how old are you now? 35. Five, I think. I just turned 35, yeah. Yeah, so that's like 18 years later, you've just repeated one of the very, very hardest trad routes in the world, Tribe, over in Italy. And that's littered along the way with E9s, E10s, ground up E10s, E11 repeats, all the way along. And I think that's a really unique thing because it's such a big block of time where you've been consistent. Yeah, relatively so. I mean, there's definitely been ups and downs um, along the way, but... Yeah, I like to think, it, actually, I, I almost think, feel like it's still going up, which is really strange and something I think, especially two years ago, I would ne thought I'd never be saying. Mm. Um, but there's something pretty, pretty crazy, pretty strange happened over the last couple of years, and I'm definitely really excited to see where it leads. Okay, well, let's, let's, go, let's re rewind back a little bit and go back to some of the early years. And I was, I think I noticed you really early, early on when I like, was reading the climbing magazines and I saw photos of you doing stuff like um, Equilibrium, for example. Yeah. Um, there was that kind of iconic photo of you looking freezing cold <laughs> with a you <laughs> know, really beanie cold, on though. and leggings under your jeans. Um, I think and it was mainly all the spectators on that day that were really cold. I, I definitely made them, I punished them that day. Yeah, it was miserable yeah. for everybody. But. But, but you'd essentially climbed one of the very hardest trad routes in the world Five years into climbing at that stage? Yeah. You, you know, you were, you were really quite young, so what? Uh, less. Um, I think technically I, I started around a lot, like 15, just turning, I think, yeah, my first kind of serious days climbing were around about my 16th birthday and equilibrium, I'd just turned 19. Yeah. So a little bit, a little bit less than that. But um, So that route, dangerous 8B plus? ish 8b who knows i don't Some, know somewhere around that it's, kind it's of number it's really hard to grade root roots isn't it and i'm actually probably struggling more and more with it because i've got so much more experience in other th things now i'm really i figured the more experience you'd get elsewhere the, the easier it would be to quantify these things but actually it becomes more and more complicated because grit's such a such a peculiar particular rock type mm. um it's it's the kind of thing where you can you can float up it on one try and then spend the next day falling off all all the moves. And actually, that was kind of that's how equilibrium went. I remember the day before I did it, I, I top roped it first try for a warm up, and I thought, okay, this is on. Yeah, and this is one session in, or two maybe sessions? like two sessions in or something. Okay. Uh, called called everybody that I wanted to to be there, either to to belay for support, to take pictures, take video. Um, and then got to the crag really, really early that morning and couldn't do individual moves on it. Spent most of the morning trying to, to link it again, couldn't do it, gave myself this kind of like ultimatum of, okay, if I don't do it on the next go, then I'm walking home. Well, not walking home, driving home. Yeah. And um, did it, but by the skin of my teeth and then found myself in this really awkward situation where I kind of, I'd given myself permission to try it, but at the same time it felt so close to, 
to, to, to falling. Like uh, I had very, a very minimal comfort zone on the route. And one of the things that I tried to do when I was climbing dangerous routes in the past was to have a, a relatively big comfort zone. And that wasn't the case. And I guess it's one of probably the few times, maybe very, very early routes I did like when I was, when I was younger than that. I also felt a little bit of pressure from the people around me, not from the people, but from myself, kind of wanting to impress the people around me. Mm. That day on Equilibrium, I remember thinking, okay, I've got all these people out here. Like, I really need to try to at least, at least give them a bit of a show. And I thought, worst case, I'm going to go up it and I'll just fall off the crooks at the bottom. And then we can all go home and it'll be fine. And actually, by some miracle, and, and I, I think Equilibrium was probably the first time that I noticed this happening with my climbing. When I got on the sharp end, when I got on the dangerous side of things, everything seemed to change a little. Like I'd disappear in this little kind of, I don't know, bubble of, of calm. Where, you know, all of the things that I'd been worried about through the day before that ceased to exist. I felt really strong. I felt really solid on the moves. Um, and I just managed to go through the... The, the, the crooks at the bottom. Before I know it, I was basically lining up for the crooks at the top, and I remember thinking, oh shit, like I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> How is this going to end? And then, uh, well, I, I guess if anybody's watched the video of it, you can see I make like a pretty big mistake that should have, it should have seen me falling off. And who knows what would have happened in that fall, but it would have been for sure close. And I, by some miracle, managed to hold this really strange position, basically stop the fall mid-fall and, and get back on and climb to the top and, um, and did the route. But I think what was most interesting for me after that was this question about, wow, you know, if I can, I've managed to kind of find this almost state of mind to transcend um, into like a, a totally different, different place where everything seems perfect and everything seems easy. And wouldn't it be great if you could then move forwards maintaining that somehow state of mind and do all these other cool things. At least that was the concept. Didn't quite work out like that, but... Yeah, yeah, because I think it's... It was, um, a, it was a promising beginning. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. You, you touched on that whole, um, you know, state of mind and, you know, state management and getting that bubble with hard, dangerous trad yeah. routes because, like, I've done quite a few, you know, riskier trad routes as well, and I, and I know that zone that you can get into for that. And I, I don't know if you find the same thing, but I look back at some of my early experiences of getting into that zone with almost rose tinted glasses of how I'm quite good at it. I'm really quite good at it now. Like I know yeah. how to do it. And I see my early experiences and think I knew what I was doing then of how to get into the zone. And I see it overly positive. But if I oh, no, really no. think back to it, I was a bit of a shambles. No, no, I think I, I, can, I can just look back and say that I was a total shambles. Um, for example, if we could just take like the first few years, so leading up to Equilibrium, mm. um, I feel like Equilibrium was the first time that it really happened well, but it was probably, it came with a big surprise. Like a good experience. Yeah, a positive yeah. experience. Even though I, I, I made a mistake, but I, that kind of, that new level uh, or that different mindset allowed me to, to, to get through it, luckily. Um, but before that, I was really, really bad at climbing dangerous <laughs> routes. I'd have to... I'd have to top rope them. I don't know. I'm just going to throw some random figures out there. But, you know, 10, 10, 10 times in a row before I'd feel confident to go for it because I knew as soon as I'd get on the lead, I'd just start shaking and wobbling and basically trying to kill myself, which is really... I thought we always thought this was really strange how, you know, you, you hear often about these fight or flight mechanisms that we have built into us, you know, when kind of everything goes wrong, we... we be, become the, the kind of animal that we're always supposed to be and we mm -hmm. can get ourselves in or out of dangerous situations. But actually with my climbing, it was really the opposite of that. I'd, I'd be fine on a top rope. And then as soon as I got on the lead where you'd expect you'd be able to pull harder and, and do harder things, I would just shake and, and get really scared and make terrible mistakes. I, Did you have anyone at, that mentored you through that in those no, earlier um, times? Were you like copying the behaviors of other good track climbers around you? Were you doing that in your own little learning bubble, essentially? No, I was doing it really very much on my own. Um, so there was a guy called Tony Simpson, who I, cl I climbed with quite a lot in the beginning. Um, and if anything, Tony was really trying to steer me away from, from trad. I, I can't remember exactly why I was motivated to get into trad in the first place. It might have been something as simple as just watching Hard Grit. Mm. And realizing that some of those places were so close to my to my house, basically that time I was just one hundred percent 
in love, obsessed with climbing. Like, you know, when you, when you start a new relationship, when you're, when, you're, when you're a kid, you're just completely obsessed by this, this, this other being, this, this other thing. And climbing was like that for me. I just wanted to, to anything, anything I could from climbing, I wanted to take it and kind of wrap myself up in it. And just, so I'm guessing you were climbing your house, the outside of your house. But I've been, I've been doing that since, since a really young age. So even though okay. I technically didn't actually start rock climbing until I was about 15, that was only because I didn't know anybody that climbed. And, okay. um, there was no one in my family or you know, close sort of friend network that, that climbed. And so my parents had tried to get me into climbing a few times. Like my dad had taken me to Black Rocks a few times and you know, he's, he's there with that like, blue polypropylene rope that he found in the garage and he was standing at the top of I think it's it railway slab it's called now like belaying me up and I was scrambling up that thing when I was really little we went abseiling a few times like in the woods I thought that was a separate thing to, well it's technically a separate thing to climb but I thought it was like a real a real thing just got, I'm going abseiling today um, but then finally yeah, getting into climbing it was just immediately obsessed with it and you know as soon as I'd meet another climber I just wanted to spend time I'm sure I harassed so many people just <laughs> endless phone calls I started skipping school like anybody I could find the weekday that was going climbing I'd you know I remember taking like two hour bus journeys across the Peak District to, to the Roaches numerous occasions just because I knew a few people over there like Andy Turner and Justin Critchlow that kind of had time off during the week um and I think actually I've heard in the past that they were both like, oh God, it's James calling again. Like, can you get it and talk to him or should we just not pick up today? I think I was a real pain in the bum, but I just loved climbing. And so, uh, and so w when I actually started getting in, into trad route, I had, I had these people around me that kind of had some experience, but I wasn't you know, necessarily just with one of them yeah. really taken under anybody's wing. I was kind of jumping around between people. Um, and if one of them told me something like, maybe you don't do that, maybe take your time a little bit more, maybe go do some easier routes, I'd just go and start climbing with somebody that was a bit more supportive to what I wanted to do. Ah, Not necessarily okay. supportive in general, but or just a little bit more kind of lax with yeah. <laughs> their concerns for me and my safety. So you'd laid your own path with people that were gonna be complimentary to Pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I remember, I think I did, I did like, I soloed, one of the one of the slabs at Froggart, maybe Long John slab or something like that. One day, but I thought that didn't really count for a trad route because I hadn't placed any gear. So then I went out and did maybe like an E5 or something at Stanage, but again, like placing one one cam and the rest of it was was solo. And then with my friend Keith, went and did Kalusa Klein. That was my first ever real hard grip route where I, you know, I top roped something. I really rehearsed the moves. I kind of felt that transition from moving from the security of top rope onto the sharp end um and actually it's a funny story i remember climbing going there with keith to try the route and i was on top rope was was fairly solid and keith was kind of a bit of a shambles on the route and uh, and i remember telling him oh no i don't feel it today like i'm, I'm i don't think i'm gonna do it and he was like, oh, go for it, I'm going for it. And I remember thinking, really, you're, you're going for it? Okay, well, is that, that's maybe how this thing works. Yeah. And I went for it and did it, and he went for it and fell, and fell off. We ended up in the hospital that night. And I was like, okay, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe this is not how this thing works. Maybe you do need to be a little bit cautious. But then as soon as I climbed Kalusa Klein, so that was my first E7, I remember thinking, oh wow, you know, E7, that's, that's the beginning of hard grit. I remember feeling like hard grit had this kind of, you know, it, it was bracketed from E7 and up. So I was like, well, you know, now I'm a hard grit climber. What else can I do? Equilibrium was the hardest thing at the time. And I thought, well, that's, a, you know, something that's only there for, for real climbing gods. So let's maybe try and find an E9. That seems like something that maybe mortals can climb. And then I started looking around for basically the, the easiest E9 that I could, that I could find, and I found the, the zone. Um, and I remember climbing that, it's protected by, I think, two tied down sky hooks. Um, so this is like a, a, for anyone that isn't know, it's a, it's, a, it's a flat gritstone wall, it's about 10 meters, 12 meters high, yeah. and it's, it's pretty much just over vertical, so like one degree overhanging yeah. or something like that, yeah. and it's just, a it's very, kind very of blank face, isn't it? Yeah, so it's at Kerber, which has some of the, some of the probably the more impressive gritstone routes around. These, these really big, clean-cut faces, 
um, and some really cool looking easier lines like the pea pod. And the zone actually climbs just on the left of the pea pod. And so you've got all these amazing looking routes and then you have the zone which kind of takes a very arbitrary strange line of a really kind of small unassuming piece of rock. But it was E9 and that's all I, was, all I cared about at the time. Yeah. So I remember doing the thing, again, top roping the thing, being really solid on it on, on a rope, going for it on the day of the lead. Um, it was the first time that I was ever actually getting filmed on, on like a proper, proper route. So again, I think now looking back, I had all this pressure. I was basically not ready. I went for the lead of this thing on a route that you really shouldn't fall off um, and did fall off. And by some miracle, the two sky hooks <laughs> held. Um, I took this giant pendulum onto, onto the hooks. A few weeks later, actually, when uh, Jordan buys tried to repeat it, which I think he was actually trying to flash it, he fell off onto sky hooks, down climbing from them. It's like a really silly little little fall, luckily very really close to the ground, and the and the hooks ripped off. Yeah. So <laughs> again, at that point, I was like, oh wow, I was kind of lucky as well. Well, I was surprised you. Is it, some of the essentials to put on just two because I put four sky hooks on. Yeah. When I did it, I just lined them up in a big line and I think I had like two, two stacked hooks, one on either flake, equalized together and then tied down to the floor. Yeah. So they were about as solid as sky hooks can be, but still come off, don't they? Still, <laughs> They're still not that sky good. hooks. And then, so I'd, I'd fallen off this thing, and that should have been enough to you know set alarm bells ringing in anybody. But for me, it was just like, oh well, well, you know rest day and then I got back on it and did it again. So then I climbed E9 and it was like, oh, well, what's, what's next? And it was really, I guess I've always been like that. I, growing, growing up in whatever sport I was doing at the time, I always wanted to try and be as good as I could, as fast as I could. I had no real interest in kind of solidifying my, my level, you know, becoming really competent, like at a certain level, I just wanted to to go higher and higher and higher. And I, and I think realistically, again, this is, it's easy to look back with hindsight, but I think realistically, probably whenever I got to the limit in something, instead of deciding to try really hard and, and work at something, I just give up and start trying something new. Mm. Um, so climbing was, was good because it felt, it felt like something that was very natural to me. And so I could make a relatively quick progression through the grades, but because it's so complex, there's always new new things to learn in different directions. Um, that's uh, maybe why it was so interesting. How much, um, what was the split of, like, obviously in the Peak District, we have a lot of bouldering, we have a lot of trad, and I think they're both really yeah. accessible. What was the kind of split that you did between bouldering and trad climbing at that kind of time? Because I think it's fascinating how quickly you went through those grades. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have come across others that have done similar, in those early, you know, four or five years, but but it's rare. Yeah. So what what were you doing when you're you're kind of um, going out? I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to think back now because I was just about to say that it's it, just before I climbed equilibrium that I really started to boulder, but that's not true. I'd been pretty much bouldering from the very very beginnings because when I met Tony Simpson, who I'd already mentioned, um, he was pretty much just bouldering at the time, and so we'd go out together and, and, and boulder around the Peak District. And again, I was just just obsessed to to learn and soak up as much information. And always um, on grit rather than, on, on grit, than yeah. limestone. Yeah, limestone, I, I, I don't really think I'd, I didn't, probably, I probably didn't touch limestone for the first maybe couple of years. Yeah. Is, that, is that true? No, that might not be true. I think, no, I think I had climbed it. No, that's not true. Yeah, even when I was really, really young, I, I was looking through the, the peak guide, peak bouldering guide book. I ended up going to places like Stony, yeah, and yeah. thinking this is kind of shitty, yeah. <laughs> um, down to the tour. Did some boulders there. Did my first French 8A sport route, which felt like a big milestone, but it was basically just a boulder problem with like a little trad route on top of it out of my tree, I think. Yeah, yeah I think that was one of my first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, so I'd always, I'd always been bouldering, and I guess that's probably something that helped me make pretty quick progression through those early routes, like Calusa and, uh, and the zone. Um, and then I climbed Knocking on Heaven's Door, and shortly after that, I actually went, yeah, we went to the States for a three month road trip, a load of other climbers from Sheffield and Keith. Um, and it was on that trip that I really, really got in, into bouldering and started to kind of knuckle down. And it, it was on that trip that I first learned how, how far you could progress uh, by, by working something and by you know, really just focusing on the individual moves. 
Um, and I think that's probably, even to this day, probably the longest siege that I've ever had on, on a particular boulder problem. I did something called the buttermilker um, in the buttermilks. And I think it was... That was one of the harder problems around as well, wasn't it? Yeah, I think at the time they were saying 8B. We thought it was 8B, but since then there's like a different star or something broke. Now it's more like 8A+. But it was definitely the hardest thing that I'd ever, I'd ever tried. And I remember the first session not being able to do any move and then slowly, move by move, making it happen. But it was like maybe like 10, 10 sessions or something. So it's really amazing how the human body can, can adapt Mm. to things and you can do something that you that seems totally impossible and at a certain point in the not too distant future actually becomes becomes totally possible and coming back from that trip i definitely felt the strongest physically that i'd ever been and that probably led me to try equilibrium because maybe at that point i felt like i was physically ready for it i had i had enough experience or at least i thought i had enough experience with climbing bold routes um, and then with this kind of newfound bouldering strength, maybe it was it was time. And this is still at this stage you'd you were never going indoors or rarely going well, indoors. Rarely, this was, this yeah. was just all outdoors, bouldering, always rock. Yeah. No, you know, you know, structured training that we often always, see yeah. these da- these days. It was just going climbing, yeah. wasn't it? I always joke that <clears throat> climbing indoors was something I only did when it rained. Yeah. But actually when I think back it rained pretty much probably at least one day in every every two. And so climbing indoors was only something I did when it rained and we'd driven around every other possible crag in the Peak District and tried our best to dry things and tried climbing on the damp rock and then only then we would go in, indoors. So yeah, when I, when I climbed Equilibrium, I was really very, very rarely climbing indoors. And if I did climb indoors, it would probably only be at places like the school. You know, so just very, very basic climbing on boards. Mm. None of this kind of crazy funky three-dimensional stuff that we see nowadays but probably to be fair you got enough of that on the grit so climbing on a board really complemented that style yeah um the one thing that it didn't do any good for was basically overall overall fitness and i mean with with we'll probably talk about this later i guess but you can see with everything that then happened after equilibrium i think was basically based on on that having having no general fitness um and kind of a very limited understanding of climbing away from the gritstone. Yeah, yeah. And what, uh, one, one sort of last thing I want to kind of just touch on with, uh, you know, our local gritstone bouldering, sandstone climbing, and how this, you know, leads into people's climbing later on is that I personally think that the, the, that sandstone style, which is more technical, yeah. interesting, a lot more problem solving on it, is such a useful form of climbing to put early on in people's climbing yeah. careers. Even if it, um, you could create a version of it that was indoors on blobby holds and really weird technical stuff. I feel like it's something that sets us up as climbers. That if we get that early in those first five years, you sort of build a lot off the back of it, don't you? Yeah, I totally, 100% ag- agree. Um, it's, like I, I said before, like gritstone is, and sandstone to a certain extent as well, it's such a, particular peculiar rock type where there's not really that many holds so you learn to use everything else that you can yeah um to kind of make your way up the thing and then there's all these other things that you learn from from climbing on gritstone especially from trad climbing and also from climbing in less than favorable conditions let's say that you you learn to be kind of tough and uh, and adaptable um but it's i think it is mainly that weird and wonderful style that, that grit has that is the fact that I'm struggling to explain it now probably explains why it's so hard to teach to somebody later mm. um, because it's just something that you have to feel. And from all my experience of, well, from, from, from myself, but also mainly from trying to work with other climbers and help other climbers progress, the hardest, most complicated people to teach are always basically like the strongest. If you can take a, a kid um, or, and this is not sexist in the slightest, but basically a girl they learn so much faster than strong guys because strong guys have basically strong sporty guys have spent their entire life just relying on muscles and that's all they know how to do and you try to you try to explain them kind of the subtle nuances of standing on their feet and changing their their body position and really balancing through things and in the beginning because they don't understand it it feels way harder than just grabbing the holds and pulling and they can, it's, I'm not saying never, but it's very, very hard for them to kind of 
make that transition, almost a regression actually, to, to accept that they need to spend time working on these weird skills um, that sometimes look a little bit like black magic if you don't really understand what's going on, mm. um, to ultimately later on be able to make new progress. And, uh, and so, yeah, like you're saying, if you can learn that as a, as a child um, or as a very early in your climbing career before you kind of learn to rely on strength and other things, it, does, it really sets you up super well. And I was super, I think, one of the things that I consider myself most fortunate was to have spent uh, a bit of time climbing with Johnny Dawes when I was really young, um, even having kind of, uh, I guess you'd call it a, a masterclass with him one day and then bumping into him at various other places like a, uh, along the way. And Johnny, I think his style, whilst you know I, I climb very differently from Johnny, you kind of look at a lot of the stuff, the kind of weird, like jumpy, dynamic, um, style that that Johnny has is somewhere in 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 my own climbing and um I think I think you stood out like that very early on well I remember watching footage in your early parts of your climbing career yeah and going whoa what's this one-handed yeah like, you see on, on, on the groove, groove for example, example. Yeah. yeah yeah and I think that really blew a lot of people's minds yeah. when they saw that for the first time with those one-handed little skips and stuff and I think the climbing you know or, or, you know, the industry or the status quo was going, I, I don't get that. Yeah. Why, why would you do that outdoors? But now, exactly. I think most people back. Like, it's funny, isn't yeah, it? Well, I've, I mean, I've yeah. seen a, a triple clutch in a competition where someone's, you know, moved between multiple holes. Yeah, and, and it like, is the easiest it. way. Yeah, and they get that. But back then, it's like it you've, required... got four, you've got four limbs. Why not use them all? And, and you're like, well, sometimes it's easier if, if you don't. And Johnny really, really helped me to say, yeah. understand that. I don't understand it even today, but I'm still... I understand the, the benefits that it can have, for, even if I don't understand the actual magic of it in, in itself. Um, and I think so I took the things that Johnny taught me and I was really lucky, I think, to, to climb with Johnny quite early in my career and also be very, very short when I climb with Johnny, which is a huge, huge disadvantage. So having started out climbing life- It's in, like in short, not very tall. Yeah, as yeah. in I was yeah. like five, five foot five, I think when I, when I started climbing and, and, and especially when I met Johnny. Um, and so to have been basically like a weak five foot five person and now to be, I mean, strong is very relative. I like the Will Bosey t-shirt with I'll her. give it to you. <laughs> I didn't get this strong doing yoga <laughs> and made me think of that. But to be someone, you know, who has a, a little bit of power and is quite tall, to basically uh, to look back and say, A, how, how difficult it is for, for shorties, but how thankful I was to have been a shorty at one, at one time and have to learn to climb through that because those short people that don't have much power, God, they climb so, so well, so much better than, than, than the, I do now. All the shorter climbers are gonna be listening to this or watching this and going, oh, this is just, this is a revelation. James has given me permission, I can be I can yeah. really good here. I mean, don't get me yeah. wrong, it'd be better if you were tall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but <laughs> kind of, I think life, you've got to really try and look at all the positive things that you can find. And, and leverage it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, you're a shorty, make the most of it. You can be a wizard and you're light. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, there still are some advantages. Um, and so you... Actually in comp climbing now, if you look at it, pretty much everyone's really short. Yeah, because well, Lana Mondra stands out. When you exactly. see him in the lineup, yeah, he looks yeah, yeah. a lot taller than most people. And I think, Car so Carol's idea about all this is that the, the setters, over the last sort of 10 years, they became so conscious of setting morpho routes for the few short people that there were. Um, basically moves became a lot closer, but now everything has become almost morpho for tall people. And mm. so it's now way better to be, to be relatively short, relatively light. Um, like you said, Andre, he's, he's definitely disadvantaged in comps, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's even worse if you look at someone like Kai, uh, Kai Leitner. Yeah, yeah. And how he cannot fit in some problems. Yeah. It's just awful, but... Uh, um, okay, another question I wanted to ask you was, um, and this really, I think, I found it fascinating watching you go through this process. And I think a lot of people who looked at the media at the time were aware that you were going through this process. Um, and there's a lot of learning points to go from it as well, is that you, you essentially transitioned from a climber that was doing a lot of bouldering, a really hard cutting edge bouldering. Like you were properly recognized for being a very good boulderer and a very good track climber and then you moved to being a more, you know, cutting edge and competent sport climber, especially on the longer stuff and the longer end of trad climbing as well. Mm. What was that process like? Because I, 
I think you went from a relatively strong and unfit climber, as in, and you really had a big learning, like steep learning curve, didn't you? Yeah. Because I remember a few of the things I heard you either say or I, I read what you you said. There were a lot of things, yeah. And written. I was thinking, this guy hasn't got a clue. <laughs> How's he doing this? Like, what 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 changed it for you? Um, it was basically out of necessity to change. I think if I'd because you're too unfit. Yeah. yeah. So well, I think for one reason or another, if I if I'd continued down the the road that I was walking at that time, I would have either not become a professional climber because I would have been basically dropped by by all my sponsors um, just because I, I I couldn't keep up with the with the with the routes that you know I, I needed to be to be climbing, or I would have killed myself doing something. I think that's the t- the two things that would have realistically happened. Because you're going um, shorter and harder and therefore ground falls were just so much more Because I, I'd realised, I, tr- I tried on numerous occasions to to get fit. I think at some point, maybe it wasn't it wasn't super obvious, but I'd, I'd started to understand that I did have this big weakness that I, you know, I couldn't, I say I couldn't, um, I hadn't at that point been able to find a way to climb longer routes. So, you know, even when I was when I was a relatively young climber, I'd always avoid going to places like Pembroke because yeah. I just, I'd heard that the roots were pumpy and I just knew that I'd basically just spend my day falling off E4s. And I was just like, well, this is not very enjoyable or cool for my kind of public facing image. So I'll just stay on the grit stone and climb, climb really scary routes. And at some point it got to the point where I, I was, we, I joked earlier that I'd, I really loved going bouldering and at some point climbing these hard routes became kind of like just currency for for, for sponsors. And it, it's not 100% true, but it was definitely easier for me to climb, to climb a hard, dangerous route than it was to gain recognition doing something else. Mm-hmm. And so I definitely, I found myself in this kind of cycle, whether it was uh, conscious or, or not of going bouldering for a few years, having plenty of fun, doing some fairly hard boulders, but there were plenty of other people out there at the time doing, doing hard boulders too. And then coming back to the, to the peak, climbing some, some hard routes, getting some, some media out of it, and then going away and going bouldering again. And, um, and the routes that I were doing, yeah, they, they were definitely toward the more dangerous end of the spectrum. And so failure kind of was leading t- towards one outcome. And it's hard to say on the grit stone because it's so short. Like what would actually really happen if you, if, you, if you did take a bad fall off one of these supposed death routes, like whether it would really result in that or whether you'd just be, be messed up. But to be honest, like if you end up really messed up and, and kind of paraplegic, I don't know, for, for, I, it's delicate to say, but for somebody that just their, their entire life was based around being outside and doing these crazy things, it's, it's, it'd almost be, be worse. I'm sure you could probably find find another way and find other things to focus on. And but it after actually it was after I would like to have said that I'm, I managed to make this decision on my own and um, and figured out a solution on my own. But it was definitely not the case. I just kind of continued on this this road. Um, started working on the walk of life for for one reason or another. Mm-hmm. Did this this route. Took some really big risks for sure climbing it um and then for anybody that kind of follows i guess the climbing scene in the uk they, they know what happened basically I, I i climbed this route that to me felt like the hardest thing that i'd ever done i gave it this insane insane grade that didn't exist at the time based, great move by the way <laughs> based on i mean it's good for pr yeah looking looking <laughs> back it was probably kind of smart but it, it definitely didn't <laughs> I definitely didn't think that at the time. I was like, oh God, what have I done? I was such an idiot. Oh, I loved it. I thought it was great. <laughs> I thought it was a ballsy move. It was, it was, it was, it was just a really arrogant move. It was, you know, a move coming from somebody that was so focused, was so closed in their little box, their little view of the, the way the world works and completely unable to, to look outside of that and see that there is this, this much bigger picture out there. But you know, we, people do that. People do that, and, you know? and hopefully, we learn from these things along the way. So I basically got so much, so much negative um, coverage, or whatever you want to call it, from the from the climbing community, from 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 everybody. Uh, it was it was it was tough to deal with at the time because it's not 
Like losing losing respect from I guess your peer group is one thing, but kind of losing respect for yourself is really really hard to deal with. And after climbing the walk of life, it kind of it was really a slap in the face. Um, this realization of oh, like what kind of what an arrogant knob I've basically been over the last few years. I honestly I got to the point climbing on on, on routes on the grit that I thought nothing could go wrong. Yeah. Like I started to think, oh wow, like life is so good. Like why have I been blessed with such a great life? Being able to do these really hard routes, you know, everything's falling into place. It's just perfect. You know, wow, I'm just magical or some, something stupid like that. And then boom, shot down, you know, big, big, big slap in the face or actually kicking the nuts more like. And um, it didn't help that a few other kind of slightly crappy, hard to deal with things came around at the same moment, but I basically found myself in a really, in a really dark hole and um, did the, the only thing I could think of, and for sure the easiest thing was, was just to run away. Mm. So I basically left, left the UK, moved out to, to live in Europe. Um, the official reason was that I wanted to, I, I'd recognise at this point that I needed to get better um, physically, especially in endurance at, at climbing, if I wanted any chance of kind of continuing as a, as a pro climber. Um, and I decided to go to Innsbruck in Austria uh, because I looked at all the really strong competition climbers that were based in Innsbruck at the time and thought, well, that must be the place to be if I want to get really strong and fit. Um, went out there, but still with no clue what to actually do. And whether it was because of, I don't know, the depression is a really big, big, strong word, but you know, generally not feeling super happy about climbing at that point, about my kind of life in general, just ended up finding loads of other things to take my mind off of climbing, mm. um, which was great. I think it pr it's probably exactly what I needed. Um, it taught me to look at the world in a new way, um, to really, to understand that there's, there's plenty of things that can bring you pleasure. Um, and if something is making you feel sad, then, you know, either do something about it or you can also find, find other things so you don't necessarily need to force things. Was that when you met your wife, Caro? Just, now, just after. Okay. And so I basically ended up in Innsbruck kind of trying to become a better pro climber, um, focusing pretty much only on going climbing in the gym and going sport climbing, but not really doing it in a very efficient way, not going bouldering, not doing trad, any trad routes, which were the things that I was naturally good at. And so I felt like the more I tried to be a better climber, the worse climber I was getting. <laughs> and actually, you it backwards at the start. So when really? I met Caro, and it was also partly probably to do with way too much partying and you know everything that goes along with that. But when I met Caro actually in, when would it be? Early 2010, it was in Turkey. I was there with the North Face, so with my main sponsor on this, they were calling it an expedition, but it was basically like climbing holidays in, in, in Turkey. Um, sport climbing holidays, so you know, I should be doing relatively hard sport routes. And I had all these ideas about what I was gonna do before the trip. Oh, maybe, you know, nothing too hard. Go and do like a few 8B pluses or something, which is the hardest route I'd climbed at, at that time. Uh, Raventor actually, Mecca. And I hadn't, that was probably like four or five years before, and I hadn't basically really been sport climbing that much since. And I got out there and I couldn't red point seven C. I was that so, was so bad. And I, I have to be careful saying that because seven C is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a really, mm. like it's a, it's a good level to be climbing for a lot of people, but you have to remember that I was supposed to be a professional climber. And well, it's expectations, personal, yeah. personal expectations. Exactly. Yeah. And some, when you've done something before, it's really hard to, to go backwards from that. And Caro, we basically bumped into each other on that trip. And I guess the only positive thing I really take out of that trip, well, apart from meeting her, obviously, is that she clearly wasn't interested in me because I was any sort of climbing superstar. Let's just <laughs> say that. I was basically falling off her warm-ups and she was putting all the quick draws in my, in my projects for me, which was great. It was actually really, really fun. And actually it was because of Caro that I kind of slowly started to find a love for climbing again. Because mm. falling off something that really should be quite easy for you is it's, it's tough to swallow and it makes climbing just not that fun. But then Carol came along and she was just 
so exciting to, for me to be around for, for, for many, many reasons. But one of those reasons is that she was so in love with climbing. And I think I could probably see some of the emotions that I'd felt for climbing at one time and kind of wanted to feel again, but had lost along the way. And so I remember just, it didn't matter if I was falling off her warm-ups. I just loved going climbing with her because she was always so psyched and that made me really psyched. And then actually really, really quickly, just from climbing with her, I started to kind of make my way back towards my old level, um, which in sport climbing, you know, had never been particularly impressive, but it was better than it had been a, a few weeks before. And so we started to climb a lot together. Probably, I don't know, a few months went by. We were living in Innsbruck together at the time. She was basically training in the gym because she was still competing in World Cups at the time. Um, so, you know, she had this very structured kind of um, regulated training regime. I was training, I'm saying this in inverted commas, but I was basically going out on, on the rock, trying to climb things. And I was trying to, I remember I was trying to climb an 8C at the time, a very bouldery one, so it suited my style. And I'd been trying it for a few weeks and, and I came back to the gym and Carol was probably in maybe in like a second session of the day in the gym. I was moaning about how I was annoyed I'd fallen off my project again and you know, all this training that I was doing just wasn't making any difference and like, why does training not work for me? And she kind of remember snorting like through her nose in a way that only French people really can yeah. and saying something like, I don't, I'm not being rude. I mean, clearly she was being rude because she's also French. Um, but you know, you're, I don't know what training you're actually talking about because from where I'm standing, you're not doing anything. You're just playing on the rock with your friends and moaning, which is very British. <laughs> um, and so she, she said, you know, if you want to train, why didn't you ask me and I can help you and I can make you a plan and you can follow that plan and that's, that, that will work. But, you know, you have, to, you have to know that it's going to be really painful and really boring but if you stick with it it'll it'll work it's just it's that simple and i was like yeah yeah please like i've been you don't know how many years i've been searching for this this solution and she's like well you know you've clearly not been searching very hard because it's not very <laughs> difficult and um and and yeah it really isn't very difficult you've just gotta i think use a little bit of science apply some structure to that trust the person that's telling you what to do which i think is probably one of the main things mm. and and, and, and the, the methods will, will see a result. I think the big problem I'd had in, in training in the, the past was that I'd read about all these different types of training that you could do. I'd try one and after like two weeks of not seeing any particular results, I'd switch and I'd try something different. And I, just, I never left the time for it to actually, actually work. And so never really saw any of the benefits and just got frustrated. And I think it's one of the things that you notice you, you kind of get further down in your career as a climber is, how much patience you lacked yeah. as a younger climber. Yeah. And you want to be able to give that patience to your younger self and go, yeah. just give it more time. You're yeah. doing the right thing. It's just good. Just stick, stick with, with it. it. <laughs> but you want it so bad, yeah. so fast early on when you've got, you know, 10 out of 10 enthusiasm. Yeah. It's kind of one of the reasons why now we're doing bits and bobs with, with some of the younger athletes in like the various brands that we work with. And it's so, it's so cool working with them. And, and I guess that's probably one of the reasons that we like doing it much, so much is because you can see they've got these incredible bodies that are just, you know, waiting to do all these amazing things. But there's so many things that they just don't know yet, either mm. with training or with other things. And if you could just somehow pass on this knowledge that you've learnt um, like, and, and give it to them right now and save them 10 years of self-discovery, God, they'd be, they'd be so good. Yeah, yeah. But... What, what would you go back and tell yourself if you could go back now and go back to Jay? Let, let's say you've just done equilibrium. Yeah. So you've already done, you know, pretty well and you've got to 19 years old. Yeah. And right now you could go out, sit down half an hour and impart a few pieces of wisdom to that, that younger climber. What would you get them doing? So it's, it's, it's a difficult question because so many of the things that I did kind of define the person that I've become today. Mm hmm so it's, it's hard to know what, what you should get rid of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because you know, who knows, like maybe that really awkward thing that you went through that was super painful or just you know, not particularly enjoyable actually really defined the path that you were going to take and you wouldn't be here and I'd be, I don't know, working in McDonald's or something now. It's a good way of looking at it. But if, if I could, I think the, the, the most important thing that I had to learn uh, with my climbing 
was that don't box yourself in to be like this one trick pony. It's really good to play to your strengths and I still definitely do that to this day, but you've got to learn other, other things out there because the chance that you're going to be able to go through life just climbing the things that suit you, it's, it's, it's really small. And if you can do it, you're going to be so limited. There's so many amazing things to discover out there. Um, and so I would say to young James, it's just climbed equilibrium. Go to the mountains, go start doing some long, long trad routes. And with that, you probably already pick up some kind of fitness and your body might already start to learn how to climb when it's a little bit tired instead of being only able to function in this very, very specific moment where everything is fresh and perfect and, and so controlled. Like mm. go do more on sites, like learn, learn more about that because even to this day, that's still a huge weakness of mine. Um, and learn, either learn or have faith in somebody that knows already about, about training methods and spend a bit of time, not all of your time, because I think it's very easy for people to get really sucked into training for training's sake, but yeah. spend a bit of time just oiling the machine that is your, your body. Because I saw this after I'd got a little bit of sport fitness and then went back to places like Pembroke. It doesn't just mean that you climb harder. It means that you have so much more fun on the routes because you're not terrified that <laughs> one little mistake is going to mean the end of, of, of life as you know it because you've always got that, you know you've got more in the tank and you know how to deal with, with awkward situations. And um, yeah, so that's, that's probably the advice that I would, I would give to myself. Okay, well, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you one, or go on to one last kind of final theme for, for today, which, okay. I, which I think uh, is, yeah, kind of interesting to talk about. And, um, and I think you've got some you know, really good perspectives on this. And I know we've talked a little bit about it before. I'm and interested to hear what this is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's around your, I guess your, how you feel that when, you, when you're working at the, your own personal limit or the, person, or the limit of the, you know, the climbing culture or the area, yeah. how does opinions and uh, the status quo around grades and difficulty of repeats and the style in which things done, how does that impact climbing or you with your own climbing? Does it empower you? Does it push you back? Does it hold you back? Do you think it holds question. back areas? Yeah. What, what, what are you sort of... Because you will have seen this a lot in yeah. different parts of the world and different routes. I think... I think it can go, it can go in both ways. For sure, it's, it's so much easier to, to make progression for yourself when you have someone to follow or when you have a community to follow. Um, and I saw this. I saw this in places like, like in Innsbruck, in in the old Tivoli gym. Um, you had, you know, the, the the real kind of champions of the Austrian climbing scene who were in the gym on a daily basis. And then below them, you had this kind of tiered system of all of the, you know, uh, the kind of close friends that were almost as good but not quite. And then before below that, all like the hopefuls that were that were trying to to follow and emulate the people above them and below that, like the children just getting into it, but from a very early age, seeing all this, these amazing climbers and but the exact, the way that they get to the very top, everything is kind of mapped out for them. So they almost don't really have to question anything themselves or learn too much. They just have to follow what other people are doing and that can be- Because they can see it on a daily basis. Exactly. It's always in front and of that can be yeah. so super efficient, but at the same time, I can also see how it can be very, very limiting um, if everybody in one area has the same sort of ideas about, you know, the, the limits of performance, how if you come to that place as an outsider, you can actually make pretty impressive progress or do pretty crazy unexpected things simply because you're not limited by the knowledge of what is previously, what's previously been done and thus possible. Um, and I think you can see that on places like, like the Gritstone, um, how you know we've things haven't really progressed that much since the since the late '90s in terms of what people are climbing climbing on the grit these days. Uh, when you think about you know the the grit routes that those guys were climbing in in hard grit, 
and the level that they were climbing on, on sport at the time. I mean, obviously there were a few exceptions, people like Ben and Jerry who you know, had already climbed really hard sport yeah. routes, but the majority of people in that film, especially people like Seb, you know, they were, they were climbing routes on the grit that were pretty much at the limit of what they were climbing on bolts at the time. And try to imagine somebody basically climbing like a bold 9A on the grit stone nowadays, it would be just insane. Like the routes that they did in, in hard grit are still newsworthy to a certain extent nowadays, and that's, mm. that's, that's pretty nuts because I really think we're, we're, we're kind of a little bit held back by, it's not just the grit stone, it's, it's like, I think, psychology in general and, and in the kind of the way that danger interacts with climbing performance, but you do see sometimes foreign climbers come onto the grit and just, they'll just like bash out like a few... E7s and E8s really, really quickly, and all the locals, are like, including me, are like, wow, what just happened there? That's, that's not a route that you should be able to climb at this time of year, or that's not a route that you just go and on site. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because everybody before us has, has done it in winter and has top roped it and it told us it's dangerous. But actually, maybe it's not. Maybe, you know, you can climb grit when the conditions aren't perfect, and you can climb these dangerous routes because actually a groundfall isn't guaranteed from the from the crux or that ropey bit of gear is actually probably a, okay. So that's super that's super interesting. And I guess you can probably apply like it's the same kind of logic or at least problems that apply to doing first ascents when you and, and big long projects when you really you get stuck into a project of your own. Like you kind of you create the reality around that project, and that can be for good or for bad. Um, but whatever it is, you're basically stuck with that. It's very, very hard to take a step back and objectively look at the situation and reanalyze things. Whereas you get somebody new coming in, suddenly they, they find a new hold or a new way to hold it, or they just tell you that, oh, this bit that you're really worried about, like it's actually kind of chilled. Um, and I saw that game with, with Tribe, with you know Jacopo. It must have been such a hard thing for him to go through those years of, of trying the thing, not even having done all the moves on it, not even knowing if this thing is possible, just continuously pushing forward, like banging his head against the wall, hoping and praying that one day it might all work. And so clearly you know, when people look at it and say, wow, you know, how, how did Jacopo take all this time to do this route? And, and James comes along and managed to do it in, in a couple of weeks, but it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. like I, look, I, I went to that route knowing that the route was totally possible that all the moves had been done. I had videos to watch. I knew about the gear. I got the luxury of climbing on it with another amazingly talented climber with Yeni, who basically actually ended up pushing me to get on the lead. If, if Yeni hadn't been there, I think I would have probably taken a lot longer to get on the lead. Yeah. Um, but with him there saying, oh, I think it's, I think it's safe. I also, actually, yeah, it probably is safe. We should just start trying it on the lead. And then it's just, the, you, you kind of knock the barriers down and realize that these big monsters that you kind of create there, they're very much in your head. So it's, 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 it's a delicate balance to find, I think, but yeah, I don't really have an answer how to move forward from that, but just something to be no, aware I, well, of. I'm, I'm never even quite sure if it's something that you can, that you can move forward from or that should change. It's yeah. just that I think it's really interesting to be aware of it and understanding like, particularly for you know, any of us that are involved with projecting, is to understand that that whole projecting thing is such an all-encompassing yes. thing and you're inside your bubble. And you, 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 because you have to, there's so much complexity to, complexity to it, you start trying to control for all these different elements in it. Yep. And you become quite fixed in your mindset because mm -hmm. you, need to, you need to fix for this, you need to fix for this. You, need, you have all these things that are fixed because you're dealing with the limits of your own performance. So you exactly. can't have too many moving variables. Yeah. And of course that is a total, you know, blind spot in your ability to be really objective after a while. Mm -hmm. And so you get, you can get really stuck with it. And it's as long and as we're aware that that's what happens, don't be either upset when you get the grades wrong yeah. or, you know, you have a nightmare and something takes two seasons when really it could have taken you two weeks if you'd allow someone else to come in and have an input. <laughs> You know, it's, it's just being aware that that's, that's how the game works because sure. the psychology is so important. Yeah, the psych exactly. The psychology is so important. The, the state of your own mind is, it's hard to put figures on it, but for me, it's, mm. it's 50% of the, of the game. Like yeah. I can be... Especially at your own personal limit, Yeah, I think. Yeah. Like, I think uh, 
it, and what's kind of what I always think is interesting and explain to other people who are still not approaching their limit is to remind them that that mental game, the psychology bit, is probably a smaller portion further down the curve. Sure. But it becomes increasingly important to when you get close to your limit, and that's where you put, want to put more energy into it. Exactly. Because people can go through 10 years of progression, and they're really focused on their technique and their training, for example, and they do amazing on that, and they get really drummed into this thing works, training works, technique works, and they get to their limit, and they've literally done you know no development on their mental game at all, and they yep. don't want to tackle it because it feels foreign, they're not very tested with it, they feel really rusty in it, but that's where they need to put, you know, 90% of their effort now. And what I, th I find really, really interesting is that there's different types of, let's call it the, the mental game. So I would probably say that from my experience climbing dangerous routes on the gritstone as a, as a kid, I developed like a fairly strong head when it comes to dealing with the pressure of, of danger. Mm. But that, that capability to deal with that pressure has nothing to do with the profession uh, dealing with the pressure of, let's say, like performance anxiety and dealing with, you know, potential failure. It's, it's really funny. I, I, I would have thought that, okay, if you're strong mentally at this, you're strong mentally at everything, but it's very much so the different specific things that you've learned along the way, and they don't necessarily correlate or even link up with one another. So I spent the last six, seven, eight years probably, uh, yeah, 2012 was when I first started working on this with Carol. Really trying to, to work on my kind of performance anxiety when it comes to sport climbing and dealing with that weird pressure of, of failing that you see when you're making hard red points where you'll basically, you'll go one move higher every time. And there's, for sure, there's some physiological reasons that that happens, but there's no reason that when you do that one move, suddenly you get instantly pumped. And it's because, you know, you've, you, you, you're getting close to the, to, the, to the top, you're getting close, you're getting excited, but at the same time you get, suddenly get worried and all these things start flooding into the system and confusing things and then the, the pump arrives. And so it's taken a long, long time and a lot of different uh, mental tactics to get through that, visualization being the most successful one that I've worked on. And still I've got so, so far to go with it. Mm. Whereas the kind of pressure of, I think, dealing with yeah. And this goes back to what we were talking about, learning to climb on the grit and all the kind of weird, balancey, technical side of it. The things that you learn as a youngster, I think really stay with you. So even though I've not climbed a, a dangerous route for, I don't know how many, a really dangerous route for years and years and years, I feel like I've still got that mental strength in that style to be able to just switch back into it if I want to. Whereas I've been sport climbing now regularly for the last six or seven years, and I still feel like I'm kind of a punter when it comes to really like, controlling my own emotions in a hard, in a hard route. Yeah. It's only just getting there now, thanks, thanks to Arthur. I think that, that really helped me, and let's not start talking about the subject because <laughs> we'll be here for another hour. I know, but yeah. basically becoming, yeah, becoming a father and either having Arthur there at the crag to, pl to, ha to play with or just realizing that there's plenty of other things out there in the world that away from climbing has, has definitely helped a lot with, with that. So maybe we can leave it, this discussion on the fact that if, if you're really struggling with your red points, then just have a kid. Deal with the sleepless nights, and then it's gonna be so easy after that. <laughs> That's, guaranteed, guaranteed, 100%. That's a great ending. I'm gonna start selling, <laughs> selling that, yeah. I personally don't recommend that. <laughs> but we have different opinions on this kind of stuff. Oh, that's brilliant. No, um, yeah, I think, you know, me and you could chat for a long time on this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, definitely. And, uh, but, you know, uh, thanks so much for coming on, you know, for this interview and, and podcast and, and stuff for the YouTube audience. Um, it's been, yeah, an like, absolute pleasure chatting oh, to you about this stuff. Thanks for inviting me. It's been, it's been really fun. I have no idea how long we were talking for. Probably way too long. It's never, it's never too long. Never no, too they're, long. They're, they're loving it, though. We're all good. <laughs> no, it's been, last, it's been really cool. Last thing that um, uh, is always good to do, though, is um, for anyone listening or watching, yep. uh, where can they find the stuff that you are doing uh, you and Caro, um, I guess you're you're on Instagram. Ah, it's super easy, like, yeah. Like, where, where's the main if place just, to connect with you? If you just look for Once Upon a Climb, that's basically, we, we have the same uh, handle over all the social media channels. And so Once Upon a Climb. Once Upon a Climb, yeah. yeah. It's the website, Instagram, Facebook. We don't really use that anymore. Um, pretty much everything. YouTube, it's all on there. 
Yeah, oh, if you could go on YouTube and watch some of my videos, that'd be great. Yeah, I didn't even know you, you had a YouTube channel. You didn't even know we had a YouTube channel. Oh. Go and watch on the YouTube channel. Subscribe to their channel as yeah. well. We even did a vlog for a year. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. Oh, I never knew that. 50, 56 videos, 56 vlogs you have to the pleasure of going to binge <laughs> upon. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I hope uh, everyone has enjoyed watching or listening to this. And um, if you're a podcast listener, it would be great if you could leave us a review um, on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, uh, as we've just um, started releasing this podcast. That always helps us. And otherwise, um, thank you to James, and we will see you no, thank again. Thank you to, to you guys. Yeah, well, it's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you again very soon.